And some of you have been afflicted. Yes. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. Somebody say amen. amen. And my, my, my daughter-in-law preached this morning. And she was talking about affliction. And I said, well, she got part of She kept saying it over and over again. And I said, man. Uh, I said, she got part of what God gave me. Anyway, prevail in life. I would sing to you, but I can't sing. So I'm going to say, you're so beautiful to me. Can't you see? You're everything I hope for. And you're everything I need. You are so beautiful to me. Pastor Denise, one of my favorite people in life. Pastor Herman Morris. I tell you, this guy, he got one speed. And I don't think it's, it's fast. I think it's fast. Yes, yeah, fast. But he's, he acts like he's going slow, but he's going fast. Oh <laughs> if y'all think he's slow, you don't know him. Don't slow about Pastor no. Herman Morris. He's a friend. He's been a friend a long time. And uh, what I like about Pastor Herman is he's different from anybody I know. I can't say I know anybody like him. I really can't. I've been in the Army for 26 years. I've met people look alike, act alike, talk alike, walk alike. I mean, all kinds of people. Could be your cousin, bro, but I never met anybody like Pastor Morris. It's like he's got his own style. All right. And I'm glad to see him here. And uh, I come to bring a word to the church this morning. And you need this word. I don't care who's been here before me. You need this word. Oh, yes, you need it. I didn't know for sure when I was coming up here. Uh, Cause you know how we preach, so we always want to change the message God give us. You know, is it any afflicted? I mean, I changed the title, but it's still the same message, same with the scriptures. I could have said, "Is any sick among you?" Cause it's in James chapter five, starting at verse um, thirteen. I could have uh, used a lot of different uh, titles for this, but the message is the same. Is there any afflicted among you? And I'm glad you. Acknowledge that by raising your hand because number one is without repentance, there's no change that's going to take place. Without, without acknowledgement, without acknowledgement, there's no change going to take place. You can't repent if you don't acknowledge, and you can't acknowledge if you don't even know what affliction is. I used to be in the world, I was afflicted, didn't even know it. And what happened in the world, we're so tough because we used to affliction, we get in the church. And then we get afflicted, we want to cry all the time. You know, you want to cry about everything. And you know, and uh, one of the famous words in the church, I'm going where I want to go, y'all, today. One of the most famous words in the church is, uh, I can't learn nothing now. I can't get nothing now. I'm not growing. If you're not growing, it's because you're not being watered, planted. You're not doing a lot of things. The reason you're not growing, because one thing about the church, God's in charge. Amen. Let me tell you about the church a little bit before I get into the message. The church is made up of people where God dwells in them. Not just among them, but in them. God has to have a dwelling place on earth and he dwells in man. Not just hovering above, up under water like the Holy Spirit did in Genesis when he recreated the heaven and earth the second time. It's the fact that God dwells in men. And in order for God to dwell in you, he had to accomplish this through 42 generations, many years of promises, even a promised land and even set up a promised people so that he could dwell in men and with man at the same time. And before Christ was born in Bethlehem and before Christ ascended to heaven, told those elders and those apostles to wait, was 120, wait until the Holy Spirit come. And when the Holy Spirit came, that day of Pentecost, it's the day the church was born. And when he came, he set upon their heads his tongue of fire, he dwelt in man, they began to speak with other tongues, out of their bellies flowed, rivers were living water. That's the day the church was born because that's the day God had moved from beyond the mercy seat and into the man that he had created. That's why man, God, who is man that God for? God is mindful of him. He so loved the world 
See, Christians don't realize sometimes where that place is. I remember a book called The Purpose Driven Church. Well, we have to understand that God loves man. You, Christ has been gone to heaven, ascended for two days. A thousand years to man is as a day to the Lord. So Christ has been in heaven 23, probably about two days. And every time we see another generation of people coming up, they think that they own the world, control the world, and they know everything. And the more and more they know, the more they, they don't want to deal with you and I. But they're going to have to deal with us because God dwells in us. He no longer dwells among the mercy seat, above the mercy seat. The veil's been rent. My God, and the, and the son has returned to the father and has sit his, at his right hand while the father is making the earth his footstool, uh, the enemies of Christ's footstool. So you, when you are in a church like this and everything is in place and just like I would expect from your pastors, everything is in place, everything is neat. But when you look, you see that you're in my wife sings a song with the women's group and it's called, This is War. This is War. Yes, yes. And you're in a war. And you know, the war the church is in, they don't even know they're in war because they used to, people shooting and killing. But you are in war. And the war is between God and Satan. But we're caught up in it because we're the light, we're the soul. Mm -hmm. We're on the earth. And they can't kill God, so they're going to kill the saints if they can. God's got a plan for that too. It's called the rapture. So you are in war. So when pastors look and get a little discouraged because the people don't show up, my mind, I asked them to come today. Some of them, most of them did, or some of them did, some of them didn't. But I'm glad they came. And each one of those people that I asked have a battle of their own. They don't tell each other about it. You're in a war. And the reason you're in a war is because just dispensational part of time on earth that you're living in, your 100 years is your battle. Amen. And God's spirit that's placed in you is what you have to deal with because the people that's got the most talents are the ones usually do the most work. Well, Because God says it this way. Uh, he gave five talents and that person dealt with he gave uh, one, two talents. He doubled. He gave one, one talent. He hid it in the ground. The people in the church with one talent don't do nothing. They look around. They see, man, over there on the keyboard, they see people singing. They go, well, I can't do nothing. I don't have a one talent. What what, what God called me for? He called you because he knew you wasn't going to do nothing. Because you only got one talent. I got one talent. Y'all may not think I do. But I got one. I can't sing. I can't dance. Never could. Couldn't even get a girlfriend. <laughs> When I was little, young. I got one now. Her name is Pastor Mogo. One talent. But guess what happened? I did not put it in the ground. I go around pastors that's taller than me. God made me short. And that was an outrage in my, as far as I'm concerned, but there ain't nothing I can do about it. Let's get back to the message, even though I know you're enjoying this thing. You'd be crazy if you did. <laughs> I mean, you just make it, the, the, the pastor already told me it's easy to preach in my church. Yeah, it's easy to preach in my church, too, but not on a Sunday afternoon. I told nobody to come back. Why? One talent. One talent. And the people, one talent, always crying. They want to do this, want to do that. They ain't going to do nothing. If you, when Moses had six, I got to get to the message. I'll get to it when I get ready. I like the drum set too, by the way. It looks like you got a drummer, but he ain't here. Is he? No. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. But anyway, Moses has six million people that came out of slavery, bondage. Black people came out of slavery in this, in the States here, and Africans don't claim them anymore. And the reason Africans don't claim I didn't want to go to because they used the N-word. They call each other the N-word all the time like the white folks don't hear them. Mm -hmm. Even when they get famous, they call each other uh -huh. the N-word all the time. They call the women bees and all that. Mm -hmm. And they got their pants down, their dreads, and they think that people are going to look at them as a significant race. And then every time they elevate, a lot of them get out of the race, 
they get a, they don't come back. Yeah. They may say things on television so they can keep us buying their records, but they don't. They gone. They gone forever. Yeah. And while we're still here, so what I'm trying to say, Moses had those people that came out of slavery, and Jethro said, Moses, this job <coughs> is too much for you. Too much. You need to get you seventy elders. And the same anointing, God told them the anointing that Moses had them to put on 70 people so that they can control these this stiff, stiff neck breathers. You're not going to find no people in uh, the Bible that came out of slavery unless they were stiff neck rebellion. And if they're worse than that, they were killed. They were destroyed. God destroyed wickedness. Complete wickedness, he wiped it out. But now we, it, it, we're going to have to live with it now. God don't do it that way anymore since Christ is come. It's called mercy and grace. Yeah. So Moses' anointing went to 70 elders. And believe me, the ones that you see in this church today are the ones that that anointing has fallen on it. It wouldn't be here. Now, they may not have understood that they only have one talent or two talents or five. You know, I don't need five if I'm only going to use one. But Lord have mercy, put that one in the ground. See what I mean? Anyway, uh, we always admire what somebody else has got instead still trying to use what we have. Like I said, my little sister over there, she'll get in that car. I remember when I told her how to drive. Couldn't even drive. Oh, you told, okay, that's good. I remember she couldn't even drive. Put her in a car, I told her how to drive. This is after being married 16 years when I went to Baltimore to rescue her. I said, you gotta get out of this murder. This thing right now is no good. This, you've been in bondage. Got a place for you. See, that's what elders do. That's my message anyway. That's what the elders do. Any sick among you, any afflicted, send for the elders of the church. If you don't have no elders in the church, you might as well close the church down. And if you got preachers running everything and ministers running everything and no elders, deacons, elders, if you don't have the elders doing anything, you don't have no church because God says the job is too much for the preacher. And elders think, sit around thinking, I only got one talent, I'm not going to do anything. You don't want to be an elder if you're not going to do anything. That's word, y'all. That's word. That's word. If you're an elder, it's because God has caused the anointing to fall upon you. And if you're working here and the congregation is slack, lazy, or AWOL, absent without a, a cause, without a leave, AWOL, absent, don't blame yourself. This is war. And if you don't understand this is war, then you're in the wrong battle because before the rapture comes, you're going to look faint not. You know, the weak and the weary are the ones that left the church. But we are the ones, the elders, the, the elders. Elders are not just old folks. Elders are people that can stand the pressure. Yes. They, can, they can take the anointing of God, the uh -huh. pastor's anointing, yeah. and they can help operate the church. When you go to an elder instead of agreeing, with a lion spirit, they'll tell you, no, that's not the way it is. This is the way it is. Mm. And the elders will show up for more than one service. Yeah. Elders put God first. They don't put their boo-boo first. Because <laughs> boo-boo ain't going to be a boo-boo without an elder. <laughs> Your boo-boo will be a, be a gone boo-boo. There we go. And I don't know Say why. It. I don't know why. Say it. Come on. Anyway, I won't even say something. Because <laughs> might, I won't say some things because some... Women, it comes a time in your life where it's better to have no man than have a man that's of no account. The Bible right said, don't be unequally yoked. If you had a good right man and you can't get another one because you got too many girls, right men, girly boys out here, you got too many women that's chasing each other. You, that's, right see, what happened? Oh, I don't want to get into that. Right but right let, me, let me say, put it this way, Jesus. When God, Moses, the Israelites went in to captivity of family. 70 people or 75. They came out a nation. And they, my people have heard this before. When they came out a nation, first thing God had to do was give them a place to worship. After giving them some water and some bread. A place to worship. And he had to give them law. Law. Now the reason God gave them law is the difference from why we give law. God gave them law because he wanted them to know what wrong was because the wages of sin is death. He wanted to yes. let his people know, okay, we're going to start right for you. are a nation now. You need law. You need a place to worship. You need to understand you can't come and worship me any kind of way. It has to be 
the yes. way I designed it because I'm a holy God. You can't bring your sinful activity, your sinful body up it up in my presence or you will die. It's not dangerous for me. It's dangerous for you. So yes. God established a place and, a, for, and how they were to yes. worship. Because remember, the Messiah was on the way. They, a sign was going to be given through a son that was going to come. But anyway, God gave them a place to worship. He, and so in the United States, we have the founding fathers. We have the Constitution. Thank God for that. If we hadn't had the Constitution, we would already be a destroyed nation. And we have the Bible so far that we can still, it's not in the hotels anymore, it's prayers, not in school anymore, college campuses are gone wild, they don't like what you say, they will beat you up on the campus. They don't want, and conservative view is no longer acceptable to college students. They want, it's called liberal. The liberal don't have an end. The law has been changed so that whatever they do is right. The law has changed, so whatever they do is right. So now you can't resist the devil because you feel like you have an urge to feel like you love your friend more than a friend, your buddy. Now you feel like you want to kiss him. It's all right because uh, those feelings got to be dealt with. Now you don't have that restraint because you can be a male or female. You don't know who you are. And that's where it's going to. But God has established his word in the earth. He's established a church in the earth. And I want to show you something. The gates of hell will not prevail against the church. We will win because we cannot lose because God is the almighty God. Now, I want to get on the afflicted. And I'll get back to that when I finish up. Because remember, Elijah said... He thought he was the only one left serving God. He thought that all the other prophets had been killed. We're not the only one serving God. It's people all over the world. The gospel is like a seed. Unless it goes in the ground and dies, it will not produce fruit. The gospel is fruitful, and the gospel is right because one can cause a thousand to flight, and two can cause ten thousand. So you got to understand, you may be afflicted, but affliction comes for a purpose. Okay, so now let's go. Elder Gullah, you have a mic yet? That's my reader. Anyway, while you're getting her a mic, because I like the way she reads. In fact, uh, even when my ministers preach now, they, they use Elder Gullah, and she's the monk. She's the monk. In other words, you got somebody reading the word. Hallelujah. And so anyway, while she's doing that, let me go to uh, my first verse. Chapter 5, James chapter 5, verse 13. You ready? Verse 13. Is it any among you afflicted? Is it any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Sing psalms. So it's two types of people that James, at the end of the book of James, the brother of Jesus Christ, half brother. Jesus Christ. He said, is it any among you afflicted? Let him pray. So if when you are afflicted, it's so you will pray. Afflicted people must pray. People that are blessed must praise. Must praise God. For we praise God when we're blessed. So when you got a church, you got afflicted people, you got praying people. You got people praising God. You may not be one of them because it depends on what you're going through. But believe me, God knows what you're going through. Affliction should be put. Say affliction upon us should bring, bring us to prayer. Prosperity should bring us to praise. The spirit is then most humble when we afflict it. The spirit is then most humble. People's husband, children, Relatives come to church when they are afflicted. You pray for them, in the world they're going to be afflicted. They're not coming to church until they get afflicted. Now, as soon as God start dealing with them, don't start praying God to take the affliction. I'm praying that they'll come to church. Pray that they'll be humble. This is what the Spirit is then most humble. When a person is afflicted, the heart is broken and tender. And prayer is most acceptable to God when it comes to from a contrite and humble spirit, when your husband, your loved one, your children, your the one you're trying to deal with, even your landlord, when they become afflicted, 
then God can hear their prayers when they become humble. Until they go through something, there's nothing you can do but let them go through. Don't sit there and cry with them. Don't get drunk with them. Don't get high with them. Let them go through like you did. They will find their way back to the Father. Hallelujah. Somebody say praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Uh, affliction yeah. merely draws out complaints. Have you ever heard, seen a Christian that's complaining all the time? Mm -hmm. I know one been complaining for five years now. Mm -hmm. Don't get nothing out their mouth but complaint. Mm -hmm. That means they haven't gone in prayer and they've been complaining for five. Nothing's changed. Come on. Nobody's going to take your phone call but God. <laughs> 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 Affliction naturally draws out complaints. And to whom should we complain but to God in prayer? In prayer. Prayer still has a purpose. Prayer has a purpose in the church. This church is being afflicted even as the church I pastor is afflicted. Now, a lot of the pastors that you see have pastored for years and years, and all of a sudden their churches flowing and growing and everything. We can't, we can't say that God favors them more than God favors us. It's a time when in an area that, that things are right and God will elevate. It's a time when God will, uh, 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 will move in a certain direction. Yes. In, in Sometimes the more chairs you put in the church, the less people they're going to fill them up yes. for a while. But guess what? It, it's no sense in fooling yourself. God going to let them chairs stay empty until you stop frowning. You sit over there looking at the chairs, God looking at you. When you when you when you looking at the chairs, you don't know who your God is, and God sure don't know who you are yet. But He's trying to bring you to a place where trust in the Lord. I will trust in the Lord at all times. His praises shall continually be in my mouth. You gotta come to a place where your elders, hallelujah, will start doing the things that the church need to be done, that the church may be blessed. You gotta come to a place where the elders go home and their children uh, start prospering. You gotta come to a place where the Father's house becomes known as a house of prayer. But we got so many people afflicted in the church that don't understand they need to pray. We got so many people that's in the church that's been blessed that don't understand they need to praise. They need to bless. There's a time for blessing and there's a time for affliction. Don't try to get out of affliction. you got to go through it with prayer. Everybody that has, is anybody in the church has been afflicted. Our elder has been afflicted. Now let's read that next verse, uh, verse 14, Elder Garland. Is any sick among you? Stop right there. Is any sick among you? What does it say after that? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Don't call for the elders in the church. <laughs> call for the elders that's in the church. That means you don't stay in the church. Paul, Peter, and John was going to the, by the gate of beautiful and they saw this afflicted man and man. And he asked for arms. He said, silver and gold have I not, but such as I have. What are you supposed to have? Uh, you, you're supposed to have the prayer of faith. If you don't have the prayer of faith, that's what you need to pray for. That's what you need to work on. That's what you need to seek. And when you are afflicted, you can come out with some faith. You can come out with knowing who God is because you cannot come out of affliction without letting knowing who got you out of it. You can't come out of affliction without understanding who your God is. Hallelujah. So it says, is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church. Who are the elders in the church but the people that God has set for the pastor that the pastor depend on? Sometimes people don't like the elders in the church. Why? Because they say, well, they think they know everything. They, they want to tell us what to do. Somebody need to tell you what to do if you're not an elder. Somebody need to pray for you if you're not an elder. Somebody need to help you become an elder because elders go to Bible study. Elders are where they need to be, when they need to be, and they know what to do when they get there. That's why Moses picked up men, picked out 70 men full of faith. Nowadays, we got women that's elders. You got to remember, just because it was a time that black people were not popular, except for slaves, does not mean that this is the time. This is the time 
where the leadership in the black community is not by Al Sharpton and not by Jesse Jackson. It's by the pastors that live in that community that know God. It's not keeping us in a bunch and keeping us broke and poor so we can be their leader. We know who the leader is. The leader is Jesus Christ. We got to understand that we can't allow our sons to grow up and all them growing beards now. And none of them want to, did, one of, not any of them want to acknowledge Christ as a savior because the other religion that's against Christianity said this is a white man. Christ is a Jew. They've told every kind of lie there is. But thank God the elders are yeah. in the church. Yeah. Elders are people that's in the church. You may not have a title, but you're an elder because a pastor knows he can depend on you. You're an elder because a pastor knows that that word that comes out of your mouth is full of grace and full of power, not full of anger, not full of complaints, and not full of hurt. You've gone through the affliction, my God. And so now when the pastor calls, up, he's not the only one that's got the prayer of faith, but the elders can pray the prayer of faith. I'm not worried because the elders pray for people in front of the church. I'm not worried about that because if they don't have the prayer of faith, somebody better have it. Somebody need to be healed. And how do you get healed? Read that scripture again. Let me tell you how you get healed. It's a lot of ways, but this is one of the ways to get healed. In the church and outside the church. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. In the name of the Lord. Let them pray. Read verse 11 for me. Read verse 11. Verse 11. Let me tell you something about sickness. Sickness is spiritual. Yes, it is. Or oh, it could not get healed with a word. Anything that can be done with a word, that chair is not spiritual. Because you can't sit on the word, you're sitting on the chair. Amen. But you can stand on the word. Yeah. The sickness is spiritual. And not only is sickness is spiritual, it's a liar. Sickness will take you to the grave and laugh at you Ooh. all the way. All right. If it can get you in hell, they can't take you to hell, but it sure can take you to the grave. Yes. The Bible says Satan yes. come but to kill, steal, and destroy. Read that scripture I just gave you. Verse 5 and 11. Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye which what? We count them happy. Who we count happy? We count them happy which endure. You are enduring sickness. Some of you are enduring sickness right now. But it didn't say it came from God. God can allow it, but God's got a remedy for it just because you don't want to go to the uh, honeycomb to get the uh, honey because the bees might sting. You can go to the brush. I don't care how you get it, but there's some honey somewhere you can get. Same thing with healing. There's a lot of different ways you can get it. Read that again, please. Behold, we count them happy which endure. Which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job. You have what? Heard, have heard of, of the, the patience, patience of Job. 38 chapters seen, worth. Go ahead. And have seen the end of the Lord. That the Lord is very uh, pitiful and of tender mercy. Pitiful. Is that it? Is that pitiful? That means God is very concerned about you when you come to the Lord in prayer. You can come to the Lord in prayer. You better know he hear you. He heard you. You better know there's a remedy for sickness. The Bible said he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquity. And by his stripes we're healed. You better know that if they send for the elder, it, it means to come out the church and go. It means he could be sick in the hospital. You got to understand that what you're looking at is not what hallelujah, what you're seeing. Because you can look at a person, you're looking at the effect of the sickness, but you can't see the sickness. Only the doctor can look at it with his microscope. You're not seeing the sickness. You only seeing the effect of it. But what you don't know is that sickness that's looking at you he's seeing a woman or man or God yes. with faith that can decree yes. in Jesus name. They can plead the name of Jesus Christ. Yes. Such as I have, I give you. Take up your bed and walk in the name of Jesus. It's got to be in the name of Jesus. You got to understand that you can speak to a situation. You got to understand you can speak to a circumstance. Yes, you may have a, a, a loved one that's on drugs. You may have a loved one that's kind of that's messed up in a lot of ways, but you can speak to that situation. You can bind that demon spirit. You can bind it. And the Bible says when God brings forth, when affliction comes, he will start getting in his right mind. Because no man wants to be afflicted. Job was one of the examples in the Bible in the Bible where he was afflicted to the point where even his wife told him to curse his God and die. Well. 
Job was supposed to die, but he didn't. Let me tell you something. This word that the enemy speak, cancer, has got a word now that it scares even the best preacher in the world. We got crusades, healing crusades. We got Benny Hinn that's making millions and billions of dollars doing what the elders are supposed to do. The elders in the church, the prayer of faith, those that know the word of God, those that understand through the laying, laying on of hands, like my mother used to do when we were children. We couldn't go yeah. to the doctor, so them hands had to work. Yeah. They still work. Yeah. 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 What good is serving a God that you can't believe? What, what good is serving a God the word in, in modern times don't work? God is still in control. God is still in charge. God has set this church up and the gates of hell without prevailing against the church. And you cannot get weary and well doing because you have been assigned here. You cannot afford to take your one talent and put it in the ground because the one talent that God gave you is all you are killing for. You're not accounted for anything except the talent that God gave you. You're only accounted for what you got. But some people take their gift and talent and they want to heap riches on themselves. They want to build bigger bonds. They're not satisfied with what they got. They got to build more and more and not love and take care of anybody. Won't visit anybody. The Bible says if there's any sick among you, send for the elders. Send for the elders. The elders got the power. The elders got the power. When you come to the pulpit, you got the power. When you sit in the seat, you got the power. When you got, when you go home, you get that power. And all the power you got is to use the name of Jesus Christ. The anointing flows through the pastor. People don't have no power that's not connected to the church. Um, I get my church from TV. I can stay home and get and do better than this. I can do bad by myself. That tide that you sow is a seed. It goes into the ground and it blesses you. Your blessings are coming from years of tithing. My God, your blessings are coming from years of faithfulness. But faithfulness without faith is not. You show me a man without works and I show you a man with no faith. Nobody can tell me that, have, that don't have works that he got faith. And nobody can tell me that's got works can tell me that that man or that woman don't have faith. I would rather have a person stumbling and bumbling and barely saved with some works than have people say, oh, right, you ain't saved because you work. Yeah, you, you can't get nothing done without works. Church got to operate with works. You got to works, works, works. Somebody's got to clean the building. Somebody's got to got to change the light bulb. Somebody's got to do everything or the church will not function. Faith without works is dead. And, and, and we sitting around looking to see who the pastor is using. I'm using whoever want to be used. Jesus. I'm looking for a talent. My God, I'm looking for a talent. This ain't no beauty contest. I ain't looking for the prettiest woman in the church or the best dressed man. I'm looking for somebody that can help me carry the load. I'm looking for somebody that can help me get to heaven. I'm looking for somebody that can help me hear those words that come from God. Well done, thou good and faithful servant. I'm looking for somebody that knows Jesus. I'm going to show you another little thing here. Hallelujah. I want you to read first. I want you to read first Kings chapter 19, verse 10. Verse 10. Well, before you read that, I want you to read. Uh, yeah, go ahead and read 19 and 10 unless I forget you something else. 19 and 10. One thing about this word, I, ha I don't have it written out in the form like a man that went to college. Because once, once, once you get on the pulpit, a lot of times God will lead you. If you don't, if you don't have your notes where you want, you got to trust in God. Some people can't. I mean, them old John the Baptist didn't need no notes to call them Pharisees, hypocrites. He knew what they were. He knew they didn't have nothing but a seat. They had no power. They had no desire to change their ways. They had no desire to see the Son of God come into the world. Even though they knew the promise was promised to them. The Messiah was on his way. Help is on the way. Somebody said help is on the way. If help wasn't on the way, you wouldn't even be here. You have done all this preparation. You have done all this work. This is a beautiful church. And why is it not full of people? Because of the enemy. The enemy is trying to take the people out of your house and is doing it through so-called leaders in the neighborhood, so-called leaders in the community, people that I used to listen to all the time. I don't listen to them anymore because in order for them to stay a leader, they got to keep you broke, disgusted, and busted so you can depend on them. I don't depend on them anymore. I don't even think like them. Yeah. 
In fact, the army raised me. I spent 26 years in the army. I don't even think like the ghetto. I'm in the ghetto, but I don't think like it. And y'all know it. In the ghetto. That's what the elders say. Yeah, I'm in the ghetto. Don't mind being there. As long as I don't have to stay there. I used to have to stay there. That's where I grew up at. Read that scripture for me, Ella Garland. First Kings 19 and 10. Yes. And he said, I have been very jealous for the Lord, God of hosts. For the children of Israel have forsaken thy covenant, thrown down thy altars, and slain thy prophets with the sword. And I, even I, only am left. And they seek my life to now take that was, it away. Now that was not the truth. He thought it was. He had just destroyed 900 of Baal's prophets. Come on. Because Baal's prophet Jezebel was a woman that was full of power. And her husband, she usurped his authority like Satan did Adam. And she did not fear God. And she had the man so afraid after he killed the prophets that he ran all night and all day. The angel had to cool him down, give him some food to eat, and then send him on his way. And that's what happens in the church today. Elders don't run. Elders don't quit. Elders learn more and more, and every time God give an elder a little nugget, which is revelation. My God, when an elder gets some revelation, I mean, it's almost like they had another day's pay coming at the end of the week. Because revelation to everything, revelation about God, revelation things that you didn't know before, but then God is showing you. Because Jesus said to the, the, uh, the, the, the angel said to the, uh, the disciples, why sit here and gaze looking at Jesus uh, ascend to heaven? And he told him a little story, Revelation. The same Jesus that went up, the same spot he went up in, he's coming back. He's coming back. And when he comes back, he's not coming back because I want him to come back. I don't care when he comes back. I don't care when he comes back. Why? Because death, I don't want I don't want Christ to come back and everybody to be destroyed. Or I, He comes back when he's ready. I don't want God's plan to be my plan. I want him. I want my plan, I want God's plan to be my plan, not my plan to be God's plan. Amen. So when he comes back, Christ is coming back. And God has already got a plan for you. He's got a plan for me. He planned for us to be here today. And the just must live by faith. Some of these people, they got in their cars and they took this trip. Some of them have been afflicted. Some of them got things on their mind. But I'm telling you today that this word is going out to somebody. Because you got to understand if God be God, you got to serve him. And if Baal be Baal, you got to serve Baal. In fact, I got a scripture for you to cover that right now. Hallelujah. I want you to read. Uh, uh, that was 10, right? Okay, I want you to read to, uh, go read 10, uh, 18, 1 Kings 18 and 21. 21. 18 and 21. 1 Kings. 18 and 21. 18 and 21. And Elijah came upon unto all the people and said, How long have ye been between two opinions? Uh -huh. If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. They didn't say a word. Elijah thought he was the only prophet, so it couldn't have been a whole lot of preachers. My God, can you think how long ago that was? Christ had not come, had not come on the scene. Baal looked like the devil was winning all the battles. It looked like the church was at loss. But my God, he said, he said, how long were you hawking between two opinions? In other words, how long you will follow Baal because you don't believe in God anymore? He's talking to the chosen people, the people that God raised up to be a nation, the people that God told Moses, I'll destroy all of them and give you another nation of people, one that will believe in me. God wants people that will believe in him. God wants people to believe in him. You got to look at the situation and say it's a lying situation. You got to speak to it just like you speak to the wind. That storm did not come over North Carolina because did nobody speak to it. It came because somebody did not want to be afflicted. It did not come because somebody stood on the word of prayer. If somebody made a decree and somebody declared where well, other people left town, you can't serve God. And serve Satan at the same time. You can't serve two masters. Hallelujah. You love the one and you hate the other one. My God. You love the one and you hate the other one. Now I want to tell you something. Read verse 19 and 21. That's going to be my last verse. And, uh, I'm, and like I said, I'm ministering to your spirit today. 
because your spirit will catch what your brain don't get. One thing about the spirit, the spirit is the, the word of the Lord is alive. Yes. Mighty, quicker than, sharper than a two-edged sword. Yes, and the spirit is the only thing. The, the word is what the spirit thrives yes, off of, yes. what the spirit lives off of. Sometimes you get weary in your flesh and you say, I can't make, but my God, we feed the spirit today. My God, the Bible says, wound the spirit. Who can bear? Don't never let your spirit get so far down that it will not quicken your body. Because when your spirit get weak, your body going to get weak. And when your body get weak, every kind of sickness there is, is going to try to come in your body. Do you understand a man with a strong spirit? My God, he can... Sickness have a hard time living in a house that God lives in. Amen. Sickness have a hard time when sickness can't lie. When sickness can't lie to you, I mean, you don't even have to go out and tell her, but you just know that you know that you know you're going to be all right. You just know you're going to be all right. My God. My God, you know you're going to be all right. I mean, how long has it been since you already know it's going to be all right? And all you got to do is look where he brought you from. If you're in this situation, the reason you're in this situation, because a lot of people won't be an elder here. A lot of people won't stand. A lot of people won't serve. A lot of people will find out they're going to start talking about the pastor, talking about the wife, talking about the church. Because why? Because it's, it's something they can do to give up on God and move and go to a place full of people that everybody's still dying in them churches this full. Like I told you a little while ago, Betty Hinn, all robbers, all of them had healing ministry. Why? Because God didn't call in the New Testament church one man to do all the healing. But they're doing it because nobody else is doing it. Elders got to start using your gift. Elders got to walk in the hospital like you are somebody. You don't walk in the hospital like you don't have nothing. You got what Peter and them got. You got the name above all names. You got Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. You got a promise. You got a covenant. You got a contract with God. This is a contract we read here. And every part of it is believable. Yes and amen. Now you got this time for you to know who you are. You got to use the right stuff. Man did not get to the moon by guessing. He had to have preparation. Like I said, faith without works is dead. It's time for you elders to start feeling good about the job you've done. It's time for you elders to stop making people try to belittle you because they think they're doing something. The moment you start bragging on yourself, the moment you're going to have to call one of them elders from this church to go lay hands on and pray. I'd rather be somewhere they teach yourself where I can believe something than to go somewhere where I get comfortable with a whole lot of people that ain't doing nothing. I'm not telling you that big churches are not necessary. Some people are not going to go to church unless they go to a big church. When I first got saved, uh, I wouldn't go to a small church. I went to a trailer, sit in the yard. I ain't going in there. But I didn't understand that God was in the God was in the trailer. He was in the people that was in the trailer. I thought I thought it was in the trailer. It wasn't in the trailer. It didn't matter whether Solomon's temple I'd rather be in whether Solomon's temple or whether Moses' tabernacle. Let me be where God's spirit is, where it dwells. Read that scripture for me. Night, verse King 19 and 21. And he returned back from him and took a yoke of oxen and slew them and boiled their flesh with the instruments of the oxen and gave unto the people and they did eat. Then he arose and went after Elijah and ministered unto him. Elijah, Elijah, he went after Elisha. He threw his mantle over him. He found God was giving Elijah a break. Elijah and Elijah. Now, he, he saw him in the field, and God said, that's your replacement. That's your replacement. That's your replacement. You got a replacement. But, but when he called the man of God to come with him, he said, let me go kiss my mother and my father. He said, no, 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 no. You ain't got time to kiss your mama and your father. You ain't got time to say goodbye to your son. You don't have time to do nothing right. except come when I call. Right. And what did he do? He cut the oxen up, had a barbecue, gave it to the people, and then went and ministered with the man that he was going to replace. And he said, if you see me, my God, when God take me up, you're going to get a what? A double portion. A double portion. There's too many people that want the glory. They want the, they, they, they want the story. They want to be in the position but they don't want to go through the affliction. They don't want to go through the pain. If you don't go through the affliction, if you don't go through the pain, you won't have no game. you got to have some game in this game because this race is not given to the swift ones. What is it? Strong. But those who what? Endure. 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 Now you people have been through something. You need a word today. You 
don't need no shucking. You don't need no job. You need to know that God has anointed you. You need to know that God has appointed you. And you need to know that you can stand. And you're not the only one going through it. Because our people go through it too. And the devil questions them every day. Is this the church? If, you, if something's holding you. My God, it's got to be the Holy Spirit. Why would you set up and go through as hard a time as you're having? Especially us down on Russell Street. And we drive from all kinds of places, but somebody in that church is being blessed. And my God, when I look at the elders, when I look at the ministers in the church, when I look at the people in the church that don't have to come to the pastor, they can go to one of the elders, they can go to my wife, they can go to one of the brothers, and I see the brother rising up, and they begin to minister. My God, do you understand what that is? My God, we, we, we understand. Some people don't want it bad enough. They don't want it bad enough. But you got to want it so bad that you're going to forsake mama. You're going to forsake daddy. My God, you're going to forsake everything. Yes. If, if somebody's yes. in the hospital, you're going to make your way there. You're not going to make no excuses. Yes. I got to park yes. on the fifth day. I got to park here. I got to be there because when my presence is in that room, God is in that room. Yes. When my presence is in that room, demons got to tremble because I can speak to sickness because I got the Holy Spirit on the inside of me. I can speak to sickness. I can speak to poverty. I can speak to the food. People tell me what you got to eat. I eat what I want to eat. The Bible says I can eat meat poison. I don't go eat poison. I don't tempt God. But I can eat what I want to eat. Now, uh, as a consequence, yeah, if I eat sweets all day, I'm going to get fat. <laughs> so so you got to look at that. But I ain't going to get sick. In fact, I get sick if I don't eat. I don't know what about you. <laughs> and you know what? Late at night when I'm laying in that bed and Margo is uh, asleep, snowing, because she work hard. And I'm over there looking at her because I'm up at night. And my son will say, uh, hey, hey, oh, uh, yeah. You, you know, there's up down that kitchen. I'm like, you know, I'm on it. No, we gotta go, go down there. And then my mind say, now you know, now you know, if you eat that stuff, you gonna have indigestion all night. You know. And my son say, hey, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. My son say, sit up. Sit up when you eat. Sit up in the bed. Lay in the bed. My son say, I'm gonna put some acid on it. See, it's gonna be like hell up in here when I get when I finish with it. I don't give it pork chop, dog chop, mud chop, lamb chop. When I put that at, when that something say just prop up, I'm gonna give it the right amount of acid. Next thing I know, shh. Good gracious, I said stomach. I finally realized the stomach is not stupid. That stomach will turn, and, and you walk around with stomach trouble. You must be kidding. That stomach. The reason you got stomach trouble because you ain't putting nothing in it. You got to put something in it so it can, because if it can burn up your own stomach, you know what it's going to do to some food. And if I bless it and it try to make me sick, I'm going to make it out of a lion. If I have to walk all night, I'm going to make it out of your lion spirit. Your lion spirit. I'm not sick. I bless this food. How can I be sick? The Bible says I bless it. I sanctify this food. Every germ is going to be in the acid. Every worm is going to be in that. This acid is going to destroy everything. Why? Because what God put my stomach, would, 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 if I eat myself, it would destroy me. Come on. You know what I mean? That's what's in your head. A company and they ate some uh, macaroni salad out there that was... Poison. Oh, everybody in the field got diarrhea but me. Them guys were going from one tree to the other. You know, in order to get your muscles, that muscle tighten up where it don't come out. You got to hold a tree. That muscle don't operate this way. Now, you can't walk like that. Come on. All the way to the bathroom. All the way to the bathroom. Everybody got diarrhea. You know why I was walking around without it? Because I wouldn't go to the bathroom anyway until I got home. In Vietnam, I carried a box. If I need to go to the bathroom every day, I carried an ammo box all day long. And I went out in the bush and took the top off and sit down. That's the best position. Let me, let me tell you something. The mind is a terrible thing to waste. Yeah. God gives us a mind. He gives us a body. And he gives us a... Every person is sown to his church. And if you've got any doubt about it, then you don't know God very well. Because why would you be such a fool to set up in a place where you could do better somewhere else? Go on. You do that. I mean, loyalty is one thing, but crazy is something else. We're not crazy. We are where God put us. And look, I've seen people in my church for years. I looked at them, preach them, and their husband wasn't there. Now their husband was sitting right beside them. They don't go home, throwing them out the window, doing all this stuff. 
<laughs> Doing all this stuff to them. They go home and they understand the husband will look at them every day. Man, I got a good wife. Every time they see one of them flutes out there, man, I'm glad I didn't marry nobody like her. Every time their buddy on the job, man, my wife got a boyfriend. They all that stuff. See, they don't have to deal with that. They got a good wife at home. And sooner or later, sooner or later, but just remember there's a time for marriage. Right? There's a time for healing. There's a time for weeping and crying. God has perfected you. And if you are elder in the church, you got an anointing upon you that don't nobody have to tell you. If you come up in the church when nobody else comes, you are ready for elevation with God. If you got one gift, I'd rather have one gift than have five of them that I use on myself. Y'all know some people got gifts they don't use on nobody else. Yeah. They ain't gonna prophesy unless they get paid. They ain't gonna do nothing unless you pay. Yeah. And then when they walk around, here's how you can really tell. They start walking around like a peacock. Uh -oh. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> Did Jesus pray for that body God? And I don't think so. Right. Oh. Let me tell you something. There ain't no flesh. I don't care how good it is, how good it looks. There ain't no flesh in this world that will not sin. The only thing can keep that flesh in, from sinning is a man's spirit grounded and, and in the word of God. Because the flesh ain't no way where I just put my eyes on, on their own looking. And don't think they will. You see a man outside your eye, he walking down the street like, you can try to look straight if you want to. Not that you desire, just that it catches your eye. Yeah. But the eyes, and let me tell you something, you don't need a wife that's always riding when you're looking at your eyes. You are insecure mess. Get ready. It's going to take a while. It's going to take a while. You understand? He ain't no sense looking at his eyes. He ain't no sense beating everybody up. Just because you think he, look, he ain't looking at everything. Your eye got to go somewhere. Am I right about it? Y'all all right. Now, if you're a husband, how many ladies are married your husband out here? Well, you know where he's at? Okay. And if he ain't where he's at, I stayed out of church for 20 years. 20 years. My wife couldn't get me into church. That's before I got married, Margo. When I got into church, I was in there for about 10 good years, maybe a little longer, and she passed away. So why God took her, she was like an angel. But I'm going to tell you something. There ain't nothing out here with two legs that's not going to have to pay dearly for messing over you. If you know what I know and your husband or somebody messing over, you better pray for him because what's going to happen to them, you don't want it to happen. And if you want it to happen, it's going to happen to you. If you want somebody to be sick, the thing that comes, how in the world can a Christian want somebody to be sick? I hope they die. My God. Let me tell you one other thing. America is trying to turn against the church and they're doing it through the youth. Yeah. And eventually, if a, you're not going to be able to mention Christ because there's too many scriptures in this Bible filled with hate as far as they're concerned. And it's coming to it, or God would not need a rapture. I, I, I pray that it don't happen in your lifetime because some people are going to have to do some fleeing because the law is going to be, they already passed the law, so you can't do nothing about that. You're breaking the law. If you stick up for everything in this book, you're breaking the law. And it's happened recently, right? My, my. It happened recently, so you better you better pray. You better pray. Send your feet. Let's give the Lord a praise clap. Hallelujah.